there's some Revelator songs that I'm like, man, we got to bring those back. But we've done so many songs and albums. There's like so much to choose from that we, I guess we don't think about it all the time. We need to get you a really good slide player in Nashville and you guys need to cover a Derek Truck song. You know, he told me Susan wrote the song, which he, he was proud of. He said that with great pride. You know, the way you say nice things about your family. <laughs> From the first note with Tedeschi Trucks, they just blow you away. Yes, we will. I wouldn't argue with anyone that said, that says, that could be my favorite song on, on I Am The Moon. He, you know, signs my ticket. And I look over at Susan. I say, Susan, would you sign it too? And she goes, oh, oh heck yeah. Kevin calls me and was like, hey, man, what are you doing? I was like, nothing. He was like, Derek wants to record some tuba stuff. I said, when do you want to do it? And he was like, let's do it Wednesday. It was Midnight Harlem. Um, and it just it caught our attention, man. And we started diving deep and we're like, OK, uh, we got to see these guys. What's up? Welcome to episode number 151 of the people of the on of the Tedeschi, the unofficial Tedeschi Trucks podcast. I have a couple of podcasts. It's been a long day. We're all losing, we're all losing our minds here. It's been a tough day for for a, a lot of people out there, a lot of fans of, of of great music, of the great Almond Brothers music. Of course, Dickie Betts passed away today, or was it earlier to, earlier in the evening? What, what was the official? I got it on the the uh the uh the thumbnail here it was officially the 18th it was it was today but that's a very sad day all around whether you were a uh whether you knew him personally or just a big fan of the music just so many uh tributes and and stories and anecdotes popping up on social media i share them all on the at tedeschi trucks uh podcast instagram account uh i was gonna almost like i should have but i've been rushing to get everything together I was gonna put a little video together of just like clicking through the uh the um the uh the instagram stories because it's it's a cool like little slideshow tribute but uh i don't want to get into too many plugs and all that stuff right now i just want to get right into it because i see everyone is in in the waiting room here i got some special guests here to talk uh dicky bets uh stories and memories and anecdotes and whatever they want to share and, and tributes because could, you know, to be completely forthright, I am not a, a, a Dickie Betts expert. I am not the Allman Brothers expert. I suppose I am a Tedeschi Trucks band expert, but that is that music world is, of course, pretty damn adjacent, if I can use that that phrase to to the ABB world. But I am looking forward to just listening to these guys and hearing them, especially uh, Alan Paul and Bob Beatty and, and Marley J and Garrett Strand, a couple of more hardcore fans are going to be joining us as well momentarily to just talk about whatever they, whatever people want to talk about. This is, this is just loose conversation and, and, and sharing memories and thoughts. And I'm so glad that I was able to put this together last minute and last, last, and, you know, late notice and all that. Originally I was going to do the, the Isaac Eady uh, recap shows because he had a couple of, of several shows in New York city this past week. And some TTB fans were able to attend, and I was trying to coerce them to come on to recap that. You get more than one TT per, TTB person at a, at a show. I'm going to want to get you on this uh, on this 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 podcast for sure to to talk about that stuff. But without further ado, um, I think we should bring in Garrett Strand, Bob Beatty, Marley J, and Alan Paul, all past guests of uh, of this podcast. I see the comments. I'm going to. Uh, going to share those as well uh, and, and try to read some of them out because i'll definitely put out an audio version of this as this of this episode as well so let's let's do it there they are what's going on guys i see everyone i hear everyone i think i hear everyone garrett you there yep bob my check my check and marley hi all and alan we got everybody here uh why don't we go around the room? You could tell me tell me where you are, and maybe just like a quick. Uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll get it. I, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I well, where where are you, Garrett? I'm uh, just west of Knoxville, Tennessee. And you've been an Almond Brothers fan your whole life, for as far back as I can remember. Yes, sir. And where are you, Bob? Right now, I'm in uh, basically Destin, Destin, Florida. I'm in L.A., Lower Alabama. Uh, at the Moon Crush Festival, 
um, where TTB will be playing in two weeks at their own festival, which I will also be at. Who's at the Moon Crush Festival uh, tonight? Right now? Lake Street Dive uh, was the headliners tonight's show, uh, and I saw Red Clay Strays and Dawes. I've seen Dawes before, and then um, tomorrow night Marcus King is the headliner. Noah Kahan is the headliner on Sunday. I can't remember Saturdays, but it's 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 really a fantastic festival. It's, it's a funny. good time. Yeah, it's great. Half the time when I ask people to come to this podcast, they're like, no, I can't make it. I am going to a show tonight. They have to sing some <laughs> other musical related thing. Or no, no, my band is rehearsing. I can't make it. I'm I'm, I'm busy. So it's like, you know, music is such a big part of people's lives. What about you, uh, Marley? Where are you at? I'm, yeah. I'm at home in the Hudson Valley. I'm, I'm around Hudson, New York. Nice. Yeah. And Bob and Marley, you guys have been hardcore Almond Brothers fans your whole life. I'm sure I got the origin story. From you from you guys at least the ttb origin story i was yeah. i was raised around it my whole life my dad uh i think i told this story on your podcast the dreams podcast of you listening to, to dreams in your car and it hitting you like i don't know if it was the yeah. first time or the second time but you remember the moment you know, i, I, I was, think I about 15. that yeah i remember that what i was gonna say so my, my dad's history with him actually goes back to the almond joys by total dumb luck seeing them in miami in probably early 68 um, to me seeing them uh, from 97 through the end. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's my, that's the shortest version I can give you of my yeah. And what about where are you at right now? It looks like you're home. You muted, well, I think, dude. Oh, I think you did. Did I mute you? Nope. I think you you're muted. I think you muted yourself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, I no, didn't no have problem. The screen up in front of me. I don't know why. I didn't mean to mute myself. I'm home in Maplewood, New Jersey, and um, I invited Andy Alador. Um, I think he I might see, be waiting. I, him. I thought I you sent know. him the list. Uh, Andy, for those of you who don't know, is my bandmate and friends of the brothers, and he toured with Dicky for ten years. So he and I have been uh, talking all day today. So. Um, we were talking about doing something like this, but we didn't really have the energy to make it happen on our own. So thanks for uh, putting it together. And oh, no, no, no problem. My, my pleasure. Fellas. Thank you. Bob, that, that festival is incredible. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good stuff there. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I'll, I can bring in, bring in Andy. I see him in, in, in the waiting room. I thought I invited one other person. I thought maybe it, like they went under an alias or something like that. <laughs> no, but, uh, I sent that to him. Let's, let's bring in Andy. Good to connect. Hey everyone. Hey What's Andy. Cooking? How's everybody doing? Hanging in there, I guess. Uh, Alan, thanks for letting me know. And yeah, Alan and I, you know, talked on and off all day today, and it's been a deluge type of day, I'm sure, for many of us. And and then Guitar World said, "Oh, can you write something for Guitar World Online?" Um, 2,000 words, that'll be ready by tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, sure, because I'm crazy. But, you know, so that it, it'll be timely. And, um, uh, and I worked on it for the last five hours. And, you know, but anyway, um, uh, it'll be nice to have something on the Guitar World website that's, you know, in the moment, you know, within 24 hours of us finding out about it. So, yeah, and, you know, whenever uh, something like this happens, uh, which unfortunately has been a few too many times than I would like, um, I get end up having to be the, uh, I have an echo. Where do I have this? Do I have this open somewhere? Do I sound okay to you guys? You sound, no. you sound, you sound echo. Okay, yeah. all right, cool. Um, Whatever. No, Alan, you don't sound good. Yeah, you no. sound you sound echoey. You might, you Someone to... else talk, and I'll mute myself and yeah, figure it out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, I was going to ask Andy a question, Andy Bobbiti, and um, we, I think we've met just very briefly. Um, but did you? So, so let me say, when I saw my dad was dying, right, I was thinking about what I was going to say, right. I, it just it it's immediate. So you know, Dickie's going to die because of course he's going to die. Where, did you had you ever even thought before today what you were gonna write down, or was it just like okay today I gotta just I gotta do it? Which I know Alan's always been that guy too. Uh, well, you know, uh, 
at the risk of it sounding like a joke, I'm not that morbid, you know, that I think about writing essentially someone's eulogy while they're still alive. Um, but I did start writing a book um, about my experiences as a musician and, um, you know, meeting and playing with uh, different people because I did the Jimi Hendrix tribute tours for years and recorded and performed with Mitch Mitchell and Billy Cox and Buddy Miles and the Hendrix guys. And then I did the same thing with Double Trouble with Steve Ray Vaughan's guys. And, and then there's just, you know, uh, going back to 1985, I've been interviewing and playing with people. And so I started writing this book and I wrote a Dickie Betts chapter, which is long. <laughs> it's really long. And so I've written down a lot of about my experiences with Dickie Betts, um, you know, personally and professionally. So that's a, that was already written. But to be asked to write this, essentially, you know, I'm writing a eulogy in the moment for Dickie Betts in the moment of his passing, you know, that'll post by the next day. And I don't know if any of you, you probably have had to write a eulogy or deliver a eulogy of some sort for someone that passed. And, you know, it's extremely emotional and cathartic and you're not sure what's appropriate to say because it's this big giant ball of emotions. And um, so, uh, but that's what's required, you know. So I looked at the chapter, but I'm also realizing that it needs to read like a eulogy, which is basically, uh, you know, that this was tragic news and very sad news to get today about Dickie Betts' passing. And I had the uh, honor and privilege to play in his band for 10 years, which constitutes some of the greatest experiences of my life as a musician. And it was a blessing to get to know him personally and to call him a friend. And that's how it starts, you know? And then I start to tell the story a little bit about who Diggy Betts is and why he is revered the way he deserves to be. And, um, and then just some great stories of, you know, personal stories about my experiences with him. So, um, uh, it's difficult, but you know, a eulogy is also supposed to celebrate the person's life. Right. And so, it's intended to be that as well. You know, there's some funny stories, and I'll give you one quickly if you want to hear one that's kind of cool. Um, you know, I mean, there's a million things that came into my mind, but one that just sort of reflected how sweet he could be. You know, Dickie had this reputation for being, you know, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, you know, for being a complicated person and not always the easiest person to get along with. And, but he uh, could also be the sweetest person and the nicest person you've ever known and very generous. And just a funny example, when one that popped in my head, and I hadn't put it in the chapter, was I think in 2002 or three. it was before he asked me to join his band, we were on the phone and his birthday was coming up and he said, hey, why don't you come down if you're not busy? Do you want to come down for my birthday and celebrate my birthday with me and the family? And I said, yeah, that would be great. And so, Alan, I don't even know if you know the story. So I went down and uh, I was the only non-family member at this gathering. It was not a big gathering at his house. His daughter, Kimberly, was there with the grandkids and few other people but you know all family and it was very nice and uh, I think he was in a great mood and they had a big birthday cake you know so 
I don't know. If it was 2002 or three, he was only um, 60 or 59. And um, anyway, I went outside at one point to just to call my wife. And I'm sitting outside on the phone, and then the door opens, and there's Dickie with this plate and this big piece of birthday cake. And he goes, I was looking for you. Don't you want some birthday cake? <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, it's his birthday party with his family, you know. And, like, he went looking for me just to bring me a piece of birthday cake, you know. And he's like, what are you doing? Don't you want some cake? And I was like, well, yeah, that would be <laughs> terrific. And so it's it's such a nice story of, like, how he was, you know, and what it could be like. And I spent a lot of time talking with him and sitting with him on the bus, and he talked a lot about what happened in in the fallout of being kicked out of the Almond Brothers and very emotional and so you know what can I say you know he was one of my heroes from when I was a kid someone I never thought I would get to know or certainly get to play with and then to become his friend be his, his guitar player in his band for 10 years play well over 200 shows and travel the world and we're all Dickie Betts fans right I got to stand a foot away from him. <laughs> Where'd that come from? I got to stand a foot away from him and uh, hear him play night after night. And some of those nights were just, without exaggeration, some of the greatest guitar playing I've ever heard in my life. So it's a blessing and very sad news today. Yeah, hopefully is my voice okay now, guys. Say again. Somewhere else. I'm gonna leave and come back. I'm still getting the echo. You know, um, Adam, if I may, just follow up with what Andy said. You know, I'm I'm a historian. You know, I'm not a chronicler of current events or anything like that. So I, I sometimes have a hard time when some significant anniversary comes up, uh, Almond Brothers related, when I'm trying to write about it uh, on the blog or on social media or whatever. Um, and today, I feel like it hit me. I was like, well, shit, I have to, I got to think about something to say here. And I was completely and remain completely unprepared. Uh, to reflect on like the death, uh, if you will, Dickie's, Dickie's death. I think for me, because Dickie has, you know, retired when he did, the immediate loss of his music isn't, I don't feel that as much or his spirit. I feel it differently than, for example, if he was, you know, still had been a super active musician or something like that. But he left us such a legacy. And and here's the thing. But, you know, I, I wrote a book on the Dwayne era because that's what I was so fascinated with and that's what launched it all. But... You know, you know, if it wasn't for Dickie and Dragonberry and the you know the rest of the band, but you know Dickie stepping into that leadership role in 1972, and I know Alan will talk about that too. But you know, he was the musical director of my favorite band of all time, and of of all of the music that they did from 72 till 94, and 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 really 99, 2000 when he left the band, but 94 is his last recorded album. And, you know, I pick out music from each of those eras. I still think High Falls is, you know, as as if Elizabeth Reed didn't exist, High Falls would be the greatest instrumental that Dickie Betts ever wrote. And I think it's his most, it's the, it's the perfect representation of the band that he led with Chuck and Lamar filling those roles. It was a perfect instrumental for that band. I mean, Jessica as well. So I'm, I, I posted a few things today off and on, including some, just what I wrote about Dickie in the book about what a spirit he was and you know andy you knew him i didn't know him but one of the things that always struck me i, I spent a long time reading um Dwayne's, i'm sorry reading reading throughout dickie's uh all right i see you, adam i'm sorry i just realized i'm causing echo all right i'll be out i spent a lot of time trying to find good quotes for dickie and they were somewhat few and far between i'll be out i'll come back
I was just going to say that we, every show in my tenure uh, playing with Dickie, we open with High Falls. And, and High Falls is a phenomenal composition that only Dickie Betts could have written. It's so Dickie Betts. It's so distinct. Uh, and, you know, his voice, his unique voice as a composer and a guitar player. Oh, Alan okay. uh, had said <laughs> when I joined the band, he said to Dickie, you're making it a little rough on him, aren't you, by making him like the show starts with High Falls? <laughs> 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 and Dickie says something like, he knows what he's doing, or like, he's, you know, he better know what he's doing. I'll, I'll tell you one thing that struck me having read uh, what Alan wrote today and a bunch of the major obituaries that are around, um, which are like, like Substantive and good, by the way. There's a lot of good stuff out there, which is nice to see. Um, one thing that struck me is that maybe more than anybody else in the band, he combined a ton of different strands of music and made something coherent and unique out of them uh, that that just didn't exist before. Like even even when the band started playing Elizabeth III. There was nothing like that in the repertoire before. I don't know who was doing anything like that at that point. You know, it, it's a little bit Miles Davis, but absolutely not. And a little bit Santana, but absolutely not. And it's not really a blues. And it just combines all these elements in a way that I don't think anybody could have anticipated. And if you look at all of the major instrumentals that he did over the years with Rares and Jessica and High Falls and uh, even True Gravity and Ken Hurt, they sound nothing like each other. They sound nothing like anything anybody else was doing. And they just like these amazing compositions that bring so many different ideas and approaches together and somehow they all managed to fit into this band that was blues and jazz and rock and country all at the same time. Well, that's, you know, his genius as a composer was, was he was able to write this pretty much a piece of music that was like a piece of modal jazz played by rock musicians. And, you know, they love Cream and they love Jimi Hendrix. And Cream's thing was, you know, we play blues rock, but we're going to try to play it like jazz musicians. And um, and so there was that influence and all those other influences. And, you know, I said to Dickie on a few occasions, because I do feel this way, um, I said, Dickie, you know, the amazing thing about Liz Reed is that you could play anything, like as a soloist. You could play anything over Liz Reed. You could play straight blues. You could play uh, modally. You could play like Appalachian string music. You could play outside. You could play chromatic, bizarre. Dickie, would, Dickie did all of these things. And I said, that's the incredible thing about Liz Reed is you could play anything on that song if you f can figure out a way to make it work. The song just was sort of welcoming. It sounds like that. Like it just has like open arms, welcoming whatever somebody wants to say in an improvised solo. And I want to go jam. It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> brilliant song. And I'll just tell you this one story really quickly. We had, we had a, we're playing somewhere and I would generally take the first solo. So I took the first solo. And man, I, of course, I was trying to play the best I possibly could. And um, play the solo. And I, th I thought it was a good solo. And then get the end of my solo. And we get to Dickie's solo. And Dickie starts his solo. And it is completely out. It's like he's playing, I don't know if you guys know, like musical intervals, but he's playing flat fives and flat sixes and flat nines. Like it's, it's completely 
twisted and it's not fast at all. He's just going like, nah, 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 nah. like it was like mind bending. And so I was like, what the hell? So after the, the gig ended, we were back on the bus. I said, Tiki man, like, what did you play? <laughs> like on your soul? That was amazing. You know, like I, tried to play the best I could and you just killed me in like the first five notes and he said yeah I went on Miles Davis on your ass <laughs> so you know he was there was nobody like him you know um, uh, and Liz Rita and all these songs that we're talking about are reflections of a very very unique personality i'll give you one other when we when i first joined the band and we were going over jessica and at the very end of the guitar solo before it goes back to the melody and it goes that part um and it's um quarter note triplets and he said to the band Oh, well, when we play this part, I want you all to think about leaves that are falling, like from the trees, and they're getting caught in the in the wind. And so that's the way they're falling. That's the way the music should sound. And it was like this beautiful image to have in your mind of what the music should feel like. And he is very poetic and impressionistic and there are other occasions where he did the same thing like he could put into words in this very impressionistic way what the music needed to do and uh you know it was just part of what made him so great such a great artist i think that all this stuff andy is saying points up points out that uh, Dickie was much more of an intellect than people realize. He thought about this stuff. He didn't just play instinctively. And I still, do I still have a little, a little I'll bit. just wrap up and then I'll probably get off because it's, you can try, I, yeah, if you want to try another device, I don't know if you're on your phone or a computer, maybe try another device is the, the, the other thought. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. I'll I'll jump on on my phone. Yeah, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know what the the issue is. Where is so? Am I any better? I think you are a little a little better. Am I echoing? <laughs> the what I heard Alan talking about is the same thing I was trying to talk about a little bit earlier. Is Dickie's intellect and how deeply he thought and thinks about music. Is it still echoing? I think it's slightly, I think it's a little bit better. Keep going. We'll try. I'm trying to talk a little bit slowly in case there is an echo coming back. Um, what I was trying to say is, I mean, I went through 40 years worth of Dickie Betts quotes to come up with what I put in play all night. And some of the things that Dickie said, I, I'll post them even still to this day on social media. And sometimes people call bullshit um, because of like the depth with which he approached it. And Andy said it now and said it too. He's an artist. And that's hard to remember sometimes when you see the rambling man or the psychedelic cowboy, the Django Reinhardt on acid with the cowboy hat, the badass, you know, redneck biker. But he was a deep, thoughtful uh, individual and artist. And he gave us his art. And he understood the uh, uh, burden isn't the right word, the responsibility he had when he did that. And that's really clear, you know, you know, going going is, is the entirety of his of his career. Notwithstanding what an incredible talent he was, or how great it was to watch him on stage, he was an incredible showman and really came into his own after Dwayne died. And really, after they got back together in 79, he was 
pretty stoic, stoic until stoic. until that point, until Enlightened Roads. Just a, a tremendous, a tremendous talent. Um, and a, I was amazed at how many quotes I did find over this long haul. It's not like one great interview where Dickie was giving us a whole bunch of this stuff. He didn't give away that that secret of, of, of who he was very easily at all. Um, well, I so mean, I, he was, you know, he hadn't been interviewed a million times, you know, through the 70s and 80s, not a million times. And he was a little bit of an enigma. And then if you happened to be near him and you didn't know him, you know, his vibe was don't come near me. You know, like he has had walls up. And, but, you know, um, for whatever it's worth, you know, uh, I always felt like he was sort of like Van Gogh, you know, that he was very sensitive artist and he did something that was, created something that was very, extremely unique and very beautiful and could be very powerful and also very delicate at the same time. And, you know, it made me think of another story. The very first gig I did with him was a private party at B.B. Uh, King's in 2005. And we were not even sound checking. It was like I went over and I plugged into my amp and I just started to, you know, try to get sound. I haven't even played one show with him yet. This was like the first day. And, and then he came over and I don't... The band wasn't on stage. It wasn't a sound check yet. And he said, he plugged in and then he said, oh, let's play this line together. And I, I'm i not sure what it was. It could have been a line from High Falls. It probably was. You know, that in harmony. And he said, let's play that together. Just, just sort of, he wanted to hear what it sounded like. And so we did. And then he stopped me and he goes, he like put his hand over his ear and he went, you know, you're a little too like hard charging. You know, I was amped up. I was like, I want to do a good job. And he said that the sound of our two guitars together should sound like the Everly Brothers singing. And I was like, oh man, like that's amazing. Like, who would want two guitars in harmony to sound like the Everly Brothers, like, harmonizing? Like, it was... I never would have thought of that in a million years. But it was so... When he said it, it was so clear what he... You know, what he meant. Like, how they should sound. Completely changed how I played. That's a skill also, being able to communicate music in the English language to people, to other musicians or to others, so they understand it, so it resonates. Especially, yeah, in, in such an impression, impressionistic way, you know, that that this is how it needs to feel. Um, I, you know, Dickie's a fascinating guy. He's a complex person. Um, and uh, it was a great honor and privilege for me to play with him and get to know him. But you know what, fellas? I think I'm going to go. Um, it's been a super long day, but I, I th want to thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. And, um, you know, if uh, there's another one and we want to pick it up and talk some more about uh, Dickie and his music and, or specific things, I'd be more than happy to. No, I appreciate that and the time. And sorry for your loss. It means a lot to me that you popped on and, and shared some memories. Oh, no, Good stuff all around. You, uh, no, it's, re this, it's really tough. But, you know, when someone passes suddenly, you don't really know what to do. And uh, so it's a good and a very natural thing to do to talk about... Um, you know, like a eulogy, like, well, who is this person and why do we love them so much? Why are they so important to us? You're going to talk about it differently, I think, 
in the the day that you get the news, you know. I you know, Andy, I think that's absolutely true. I still have the echo. So I'm going to just say this and then sign off too because it doesn't seem to be working, but um that's why as hard as it is to write things on the day that things happen like this. It also helps us process it. And I think it helps us express it to other people better and with more emotion and emotional clarity. Right. I couldn't agree more because it's the way you feel and the way we feel today is different than it'll be tomorrow. A little bit, you know? Because you're absorbing it. You can't help it. You're still processing it. And I know I am, and we all are. And and sometimes, you know, it, it takes a very long time to process, um, you know, a loss of great magnitude to you. You know, a really long time. But so thank you, guys. Um, and... Um, I'm happy to jump on with you guys again if we want to uh, continue this. Yeah, that sounds like a, a great idea with better better technical. I appreciate everyone in the in the chat rolling with us. Thank you guys for for sure. I and if see. I have it together, we'll find out. Guitar World Online by tomorrow. The yeah. piece will be up there. It's going to be <laughs> raw. I bet. Forget the kicker. You don't need a kicker. Say what? I said, forget the kicker, you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, guys. Thank you. Well, I'll thank you, you again. again. Thanks, Andy. You got to take care. Have yeah. a good night. Alan, your your echo's not bad. If you want to stick around. sound okay now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that's yeah. even better. Yeah. And okay. I, I turned off my Air, Air, AirPods, too. So they, that that was my problem as well. Maybe yeah. it was uh, it was Andy actually. He sounded good, but maybe something about his connection threw an echo on several of you. I don't know. I'm I, I we're anyway. Anyhow, back to well, the conversation. Adam, Adam, if I might just to put a put a put a bow in that, but I want to throw it back to Alan because this is this is kind of the question, Alan. I'd been teasing, and then you came off that I've backed off in this or that. But that difficulty in kind of writing that piece, even if you know you're supposed to be writing it or even though you know it's coming, it's still like you got to sit down and do that. Um, what's that process like, man? And how long does it take you? Well, um, there's no way to answer how long it takes because it, it's all different. You know, I posted something. I just decided I wanted to get something up. So I shared something on my sub stack today, uh, Low Down and Dirty, which I had. Um, it was a variation of something I wrote for Dickie's 80th birthday um, a few months back. And, you know, I was glad to get it up quickly, but I looked at it a little bit ago. And and, and I, I mean, to be honest, I thought of all kinds of other things I could have said. Um, if I had waited a day, I, I would have done something more original, <laughs> to be honest. But I wanted to burn with the um, intensity of just doing it. And... Um, you know, I wrote posts after Butch passed away that was very, very raw. And I've reshared it over the years, maybe on the anniversary of his birthday or his passing. And I look at it and I, I feel the rawness and I maybe have tweaked it a tiny bit, but basically I just leave it. And I think the rawness is, is okay. It speaks for itself and it shows the actual emotion. And that's why people respond to it in the first place, because... Um, you know, obviously, like Andy and I had a relationship with Dickie, a different relationship, but we both knew him as a person. So um, on one hand, our, our reaction is different than all the fans, but also it's it's not. I mean, it's it's reflective. Uh, it's just with a little bit different perspective. But um, the, the basis of it is 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 not that different in, in a way. Uh, um, and so I think fans and people who just love the music never knew the person feel feel a rawness. Um, with the loss. And so reflecting that is is not a bad thing. Um, and and I, I think it's amazing, like the, the, what Dickie, what, what Andy was talking about, how Dickie described the music, like think of leaves falling from a tree and try to play like the Everly Brothers voices and stuff is really revealing of the person Dickie was. And 
some of his more outrageous behavior when he was going through bad periods with uh, drugs and alcohol, um, you know, he could behave pretty outrageously. And people saw that and developed a vision of him as, as a basically a, like a redneck hellion. And um, it's such a one dimensional view of him. I don't I don't chastise anyone for thinking that because his own behavior led to it. I mean, honestly, but he was so much more than that. Um, and he did have this extremely uh, creative, artistic, vulnerable, sensitive side that I don't think it's surprising if you listen to his music. I mean, this is the guy who wrote uh, Jessica, the most, uh, you know, happy song ever, and who wrote High Falls and, uh, you know, one of the most complex uh, rock instrumentals. Um, you know, so that that was all in him. He, he wrote the guitar leads on Melissa. Um, obviously, Melissa is, is, is very much a, a Greg Allman song, but... Um, it, it is what it is and, and the classic we all love is in, in large part because of Dickie's solo. So that, that all came out of his mind. So of course he was a sensitive, creative, uh, deep person. He just didn't always show that um, in public. And so that, that side of him sometimes got lost. And so I, I think when I was writing about him, um, both, both long, uh, you know, over the years and especially now, as his memory is being set into stone to some extent, that's the stuff I wanted to emphasize and, and put on the record because I, I you know, I, I think it's, um, that's the person I knew and, and understood. Um, and that's not to downplay his his bad behavior or his excesses. I mean, there's plenty of that in, in both of my books about the man. Um, but, that's, but that's not how, nobody should be, re be remembered for their worst. Um, moments, especially someone who created so many great moments that are among the greatest in the history of, you know, modern music, in my opinion. One thing that kind of that I started to think about today, reading the things people said about him and about how his, his songs made them feel is that, you know, what what you get from Blue Sky, what you get from Jessica, what you get from some of these other songs is like, that's that's who he was maybe trying to be and like nobody can be like that always and maybe he had more times he didn't get there than most like that's you know the transcendence he was trying to find is and the peace he was trying to find is is in those songs maybe yeah i mean i think that's a a valid perspective you know he was creating art that was the world he wanted to live in um you know, but he, I think, you know, Andy, Andy sort of implied this, I think, and and I wrote about it and Will Moore, he, he really was very cerebral about music and you could talk to him when he was in the right mood about, um, you know, modern, I mean, electric blues like T-Bone Walker, B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Albert King. Uh, country blues, Robert Johnson, Blyden Willie McTell, country music. I mean, Roy Clark, Les Paul, Charlie Christian, um, you know, jazz. Obviously, I just mentioned Pharaoh Sanders. He talked about, I mean, Lee Morgan, Horace Silver. And and not just like, oh, I like this song. I mean, he knew their catalogs. He understood their music. And, um, you know, it was, it was he was really deep with that. He really was. And um, I, I got to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy that um, so Andy and I have this band Friends of the Brothers, also Junior Mac. And I, I know uh, most of you guys, I think, have seen us. Um, but we're playing um, April 27th, next Saturday at Fairfield in Fairfield, Connecticut. And uh, I'm really, really happy we have that gig coming up because we are going to just blow it out. Um, we're going to, you know, one of Dickie's favorite words was uh, he used to always like to say cause a ruckus. We're going to cause a ruckus. So we're going to cause a ruckus. We're going to put together a, a ultimate Dickie Betts set list, and we're going to just uh, blow it out in, in honor of Dickie. So uh, anyone, if you can be there, Marley, I don't think you're that far from Fairfield. I don't know. Anyone who can come try to get there, it's going to be uh, fantastic. And I want people in the building who are in the church, so to speak, because that's that's what's going to be happening for us on stage. And the more people who are in the audience with that uh, frame of mind, the better. Seems like there's such a carryover between 
like or, or that that attitude permeates all of the Almond Brothers members. You guys could speak to this more, and but even Tedeschi Trucks Band, how much respect they have for the history of music, how much they are into educating themselves about music, the fans about music, the diverse tastes that dive into to to jazz and sometimes more complicated things. There's such a such a reverence for for history that shines through with with the Allman Brothers and and Dicky and one of the Dickie and Derek too. One of the things that has always always attracted me to that band from the very beginning, and it was those discussions about you know the that starts with the reverence for the Dwayne era and Barry, and then it sort of continues out from there. I want to read something real quick just because I found this great quote. I'm going to save some of these because I'm going to post them later, but. Here's one that, that he said to Tom Nolan in 1975, that book, Almond Brothers Band, Biography and Words and Pictures. When I write something that I'm proud of, like Elizabeth Reed, where does that melody come from? Do you think I write one note after another saying, oh boy, this is catchy? No, that melody is given to me because I've dedicated myself so much to that guitar. Where it comes from, I do know, though I will not say. That's Forrest Richard Betts in a nutshell right there. And I'll give one more little one. How far can you see? That's how far you can play. How far can you think? Can you imagine the universe? Can you look at the sky? You can see it, so surely you must be able to imagine it. But you can imagine further than what you can see, so that's how far you can play. I'm not trying to be mushy or nothing, but that's how far you can get into somebody you care about. Whether you can see or hear, that's yours, man. You don't have to buy it. It's yours. All you got to do is look at it, quit analyzing. When I'm playing, the first thing I have to do if I'm going to play anything to 20,000 people is quit analyzing what I'm doing. JMO says the same, almost the exact same thing in JMO speak. Alan's got several different quotes of that <laughs> over the years saying something like that. Um, anyway, there's Dickie. I, I just want to throw that in because th that, that's the kind of shit that he says or does. And you're just like, damn. <laughs> that's cool. I was going to say that's cool to hear. And that's inspiring for me personally, just to, you know, we shouldn't put limits on ourselves. And I think it's good to have that sort of reminder. And, you you know, Alan and and you, and Andy was speaking to like writing something about Dickie that's so raw and so fresh. But, you know, that's that gives the reader one sort of feeling that we appreciate. But also in the coming days, weeks and months and years, as we all write, and reflect and share stories about Dickie, like there's no limit also on how much appreciation we can have for his story and his music. There's no, there's no, like the gratitude and, and love and, and enjoyment for music. These are, these are limitless things. And that's kind of exciting to me, like in a way that like, there's no, there's no limit on how excited I can get, you know, feeling the feeling inside of seeing the next TTB show or listening to mountain jam. The next time I click it on my Spotify, my computer or, or strum the Almond Brothers lick on my guitar behind, like there's no limit on how much appreciation we can have. And that's, I think, the, the best we can do, like when we don't know how to mourn, suppose, you know, but everyone's got to do their own thing. But the music is certainly going to help us all. I know that much. Yeah, it will always be there for us, for sure. Um, hey, guys, I'm going to log off, too. I'm, I'm, my, this has been a long intensity. Oh, I'm today. sure. I appreciate it. I, yeah, I appreciate you doing this and all of us to get together and uh, and talk and like, good to see all you guys um, and and um, I hope that uh, hope it provided some solace for anybody out there, somebody maybe and uh, you know tune it, keep tuning in. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Look, I'll look out for some clips and and audio video from that gig next Saturday for sure. I'm always looking yeah. for, for music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's gonna be a special one. Have a good Thank one. You. Cheers. Hey, Alan, be guys. well, man. We'll Thank see you. you. Thank Cheers. you. Bye, guys. Cheers. 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 And then there were there were four. Garrett, I want to get to you. I appreciate your patience and letting everyone speak. And and Andy and and Alan and and Bob dive into the weeds. The weeds especially. Uh, Tell me some. You can feel free to share whatever you want about your Dicky memories, or all in brothers' memories, whatever you wanted to to share, Garrett. Man, I've been I've just been lucky to sit here and listen to all that. I, Same. I hated to even try to jump in. I was like, man, I I want to, but I'm like, this is so good. I don't want to interrupt and throw anybody off because I was taking it taking it all in, and I I was really enjoying it, but. I mean, I never, I never got to see Dickie live. Unfortunately, him with the Allman Brothers was before I was of age to be able to 
to go. I mean, my my version was, of course, Derek Warren, O'Teal, Greg, Butch, J-Mo. That was my version. But, you know, I've seen Devin and uh, Devin Allman and Dwayne Betts play Dickie's music so many times. It's Dwayne gets up there and plays dad's songs. It's almost like Dickie is playing through him in a way because they're they both have a very similar style They're And man, Dwayne even kind of sounds like daddy when he goes to sing. And I'm like, man, I, I know I'm watching Dwayne, but I feel, I feel like I'm watching Dickie right now. And I feel like, you know, I saw the Allman brothers play blue sky several times and I feel like I'm kind of connected in that way. Cause I never got to see Dickie, but I got to see his music enough that, you know, it, it resonated with me. I mean, immediately when I read the news at work this morning, I, first song I threw on was Blue Sky. I'm like, you know, Home Depot may not like it, but I'm going to throw on Dickie's music on my phone and just have it sitting here at the computer at the customer service desk, just in my ear, at least. If somebody else hears it and, want, and wants to talk, cool. But, you know, that was just my little way of just kind of going through it. I'm like, I can't really express how I'm feeling because I'm at work, but I threw on the brothers and listened to several songs and just kind of let it hit me that way. And like, like music can be therapy in its own way. And it's amazing how it does that. Um, I may misquote this. I don't know where I heard it, but um, there was a, there's a quote out there that says music speaks when words can't. And, you know, anytime a musician like this dies, especially in the almond family, I just, I don't ever have the words. I'm like, I don't know how to describe what I'm feeling, but, you uh but you know you just start listening to the music and you let that hit your heart and it's just like wow the music just said everything i wanted to say and you know even rambling man i was listening to that earlier and the line came up it was uh trying to make a living and doing the best i can i'm like man that hits me because that's what we go out to do every day is you know we go out to make a living we do the best we can at what we do and that's all we that's all we can do is just keep moving on it's just it's amazing how, you know, even so long, as many years after it was written, the, the songs still find a way to resonate. And that's just the power, not only in the music, but in the people that wrote it. Well, so well said. I appreciate you sharing, sharing all that. Did anyone at the, at the store comment or re reply, reply to, or respond to the, to the music or, or playing uh, here? Not, not really. I mean, I, I engaged with some people. I just kind of, you know, ask them if they'd heard about it. And, you know, I have, I have some people I work with that are, you know, fans of the band and they came up and they're like, Oh, did you hear Dickie? You know, Dickie passed away. And I'm like, yeah, I'm standing here at the desk. I got Almond brothers playing kind of quieter, but just something so I can listen to. And they're like, Oh man, that's cool. And, you know, I mean, one of the first albums my dad ever put on for me was live at Fillmore East. And to this day, that is probably by far my favorite live album ever. Um, I'd put that up against anything anybody threw at me. I'd be like, okay, you like that? Well, go go listen to Live at the Fillmore East if, if they hadn't heard it. I mean, I've never come across somebody that hasn't heard that. But, you know, I, I, have, I haven't listened to that yet tonight. I'll probably venture into that one. Maybe tomorrow on the way to work, I'll start listening to it or something. But, I mean, just it, it's, it's amazing. It just uh, music just stands the test of time and even – you can always relate it in some way. Something happens and you're like, man, that that hits me. And like, you know, Blue Sky is such a happy song. I can throw that on on the hardest day and I can be like, wow, this puts me in a good mood because it's just, and Jessica too. I mean, those are two songs I can throw on any moment. I can be having a rough day and I can hear that and I go, okay, that already makes it better because those songs just uplift you in a way. Yeah, so so well said. I appreciate all all that. Wow, I, where I I had so many things, so many thoughts and things I respond to. I, now I think I, I lost a bunch of bunch there's of things. Adam, I there's, a, there's a there's a point I want to make about Dwayne favoring his pops that that um I because that's always the first time I saw Dwayne Betts play was 1995 at Red Rocks. He came out and played. I don't know. He's 14, 15 years old. Played on Dreams and really did really well. I always thought Dickie did a, a beautiful job on that song too. And then a couple of years later, I saw him with a band called, at that point, called Oakley Krieger Band. It was Barry Oakley, Barry Dwayne Oakley, Waylon Krieger, uh, uh, 
Robbie Krieger, the Doors' son, and a couple others. And he came out and played, and he was maybe 19 or 20, Dwayne was. And I was like, oh, my God, I am looking at Dickie Betts 1971. It was like spitting image. And I, for me, it's always been that way with Dwayne is, is – two things we have expectations on the kids and i think that's really unfair for them they didn't you know none of them chose to be born in these families and be automatically in the public eye simply because their mom and dad you know their dads who their dads were let alone be virtuosos but but they but but by the same token that's why we pay attention to them in the first place or or maybe not the only reason but a, a reason why they get attention i guess what i'm saying though is it happens to be that Dwayne channels his dad and, you know, I remember at some times people would be like, well, he sounds, he sounds like, I'm like, yeah, he sounds like Dickie. You know why? Because he's Dickie's son. He can't help it. It's in his nature. It's in his nurture. And I think Dwayne does a lot. Like he's had a long career, so he does, he's done a lot. So I, I, I'm thinking just out loud about Garrett's point about seeing Dwayne and it just, man, it, I, it's still every time he sets his jaw like his dad does. He leans in. He's not quite as animated as Dickie got later in, in his stage life. but. Um, and I always, I, I do, and I, I remain this way, feel uh, uh, very wary with the kids, um, you know, just because I think it's an unfair expectation and those things. But, but I agree with you, Garrett. It's just, it's uncanny. And really Dwayne, Dwayne channels his dad in a way that is very respectful and very much to me, it's a, it's a nature thing. So it's nature and nurture. You I was know. going to say that there's something in the in the blood. I think that's yeah. a real thing that's genetic that's passed on. It's something in the environment being around the music. But I think it's something spiritually and something energy that's also passed down from generation to generation. I wouldn't doubt as we that. as we speak of you know always speak about how Derek is the in the reincarnation of of, of Dwayne Allman in a lot of ways. Just, just there. One second, I, I've got to say that too. But it, it's been really good talking to all of you guys. Um, oh, thank thanks, you, Marley. Sorry, man. Meet you, Bob and Garrett. Yeah, likewise. Uh, you, guys, you guys have a wonderful night. I'll talk to you soon. I hope. Oh, you got Me it. Too. Good talking to you, Marley. Oh, cheers, cheers, Adam. I've got a minute. I've got a little bit left on my battery on my on my thing. So if I, I'll go until the battery goes. No big deal. You were saying though, I'm I'm happy to just keep talking. Oh yeah. Oh, where was I going to go with this? So so many things. Like just just how there's such a family connection. I think for us as fans and within the the, the gener generations of musicians that that connects us. Like we're almost like talking. Like and, and obviously, uh, Alan and Andy have have had a relationship with uh, with with, with Dicky, but it does feel like in some ways like the music community it, well it's definitely true that the music community lost lost a legend and all that but the fans it's almost like we all sort of lost a family member even like as like even as tedeschi trucks fans just looking in and the various like social media fan groups and stuff like we're all posting about like dicky like it's not a tedeschi, tedeschi a tedeschi trucks fan member but it's such like a a, an extended family member to all of us and and however extended it is it's just so meaningful whether it's garrett speaking passionately about about what the music means to him or if it's alan paul or andy who had like a personal relationship with the guy that same passion for the music and and the person what we know of the person it just shines through and that's just something that connects us all and it makes it feel like a family it makes me feel a, a part of things and like i don't know that's what i appreciate just getting to feel like a part of this world. And I'm not somebody who knew Dickie personally. I'm not the expert, like I said, but just to, you know, I would have felt, I would have regretted not get, you know, providing whatever platform I have to, to people if they wanted to speak on, on Dickie and as soon as possible, because now is sooner than later. And I was going to do the, do the other, the other episode about, uh, about Isaac shows anyway. So I'm like, what the, you know, what the hell Let's fucking do this. Let's, let's, let's hey, talk. You know, let's talk. Like Adam, there's, there's been a thing about, you know, back in the earliest days of the Almond brothers, you know, the brotherhood was a thing and it was a legit, very real thing for them. And that, mm -hmm. that fell apart for any number of reasons, money, drugs, success, you know, you get older, the deaths, everything else. When the band came back together in in '89, which is when Warren and Woody joined, and 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 you know, really Dicky again proved what a monster he was at that point after being off the radar for a while. They embraced the family, the extended family concept, and I think that if you if you look at bands and fan communities, and I and I do actually for a living, and I'm part of one, and you know those things like 
it is very much and functions very much like a family. And, and it is, we are like very distant cousins. You know what I mean? Like, like, like we, you don't know them, but you do know them because they are. And we, you know, there is a line for me between like us and those people personally and their family lives and everything else. And I'm very careful, Bob, very careful about that line because I don't know them personally, nor do I really need to, to understand the music that they're giving me, you know? But it is very much, uh, you know, like the family. Man, my phone was blowing up, man, today. I'm from all kind of. It wasn't just fans either, but of course, anybody. I'm sure same thing happened with y'all too, right? Anybody, anybody who knows you has written you and said, "Oh, Dickie Betts died." I'm sorry to hear that, right? Like it's just, you know. But um, it is. It's real, you know. And I come from a very dysfunctional family, so one of the reasons I, I, I you know, sort of embrace this concept, I guess, in my later age, is like, wow, that's what this stuff is. There's family in the communities outside of your immediate blood family. And then in, in the case of this band, they're legit our families, you know, within it, right? Like, like legitimate people and lineage and, and brothers and sisters and, you know, aunts and uncles and wives and, and ex-wives and, you know, all of that, you know, everything. I appreciate you having me on, man, and and uh, making time. I was Lake Street Dive. I'm telling y'all, what a band! They are a great festival band. Don't miss them at a festival. And Red Clay Strays, man, wow, they're coming up. Um, so, and I'm looking for tomorrow. Um, Mark's King Band is playing, and I've I've already put into the universe that I hope I will get some Almond Brothers something when I see Mark's King Band set tomorrow night. Yeah, such a such a fan to to hear good stuff and to hear you speak to the family connection. I, that seems to be such a thing that's that's shining through as a theme as we talk more and more. Like how Garrett was talking about you, how your dad basically gave you the Fillmore East album. Did I hear that correctly? Oh, he had it. He played it for me. He, he yeah, my dad was there. <laughs> he was <laughs> there. I sh when I had him on the podcast episode seventy going. A little worth ways back at this point like i had him on and he, and he showed a magazine uh what was the the magazine the british magazine i forget what the name of it, but it's this british magazine that had a picture of him in the uh at the uh the film i'm sure i've sent it to, to you Bob you come by this naturally son was that you come by this naturally me yes well that's what the episode was about with my father was really not well, not specifically the that Almond Brothers show that we talked about. Right. The Almond Brothers in that show was the Fillmore East. Was that that's his like heyday of music? I mean, he was into he's in. We talk about other music and when he got into jazz and all that stuff. His influences. He's he's more of the jazz influences also, like Derek and all, and citing all the the, the big jazz guys from from eras past. But but really, the Fillmore East and going to all the legendary acts was his his heyday. So I guess that's. That's maybe how it's in my blood too. That's maybe that's where where just my fandom got into blood, and he plays too, and I play a little bit, but you know, just for fun, messing around, make noise, and bother bother everyone. Hey, Garrett, man, it was great to meet you, dude. Great to meet you as well, Bob. And, and Adam, I appreciate you, man. It, you know, it's always a pleasure chop it up with you, my boy, and uh, my brother, and and uh, appreciate you having me and let me let me talk a bit um having a chance to say something i did i thought about it too i put a couple posts up i got yeah. one more today yeah i think i think this this conversation about dicky and tributes to dicky i think i have a feeling it's just getting started as like the, the guys were saying we're all kind of still processing it yeah. and so and things are not planned yet i'm sure the the uh the big house museum is going to plan something i spoke to uh Oh, was the uh, uh, end end of the line that the the guys from the that tribute band? Those guys yeah. played at at Greg's tribute and all these things. So there's there's gonna be some events events happening soon. So I'm I'm gonna definitely try to uh, I'll use the word uh, not not coerce, not harass, uh, uh, reach out to politely. Uh, up. Yeah, about getting some people on who are connected to whatever dicky betts tributes are going to be happening you know throughout the country and and and, and making and i didn't even speak to it but it was it just was so and it speaks to the family stuff is like that that trip that i went to with my father uh to macon and to see ttb uh, at the fox in atlanta in 2022 i think that was it that was two that was that was two years ago and to, to be in the and visit the the big house museum how special that was to before me and just to stand in the living area and and the room where like uh 
you know, he wrote uh, where Dickie wrote some of these, you know, guy, iconic, iconic songs. This is the window where he looked out of in this bay window where he wrote blah, 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 blah. I'm like, like, damn, it's it, it's so special. Yeah. And there is something to this blood because I, I me and you, I guess a, lo a lot of us, I think Garrett, too, we're all sports fans and we use a lot of sports analogies in the and, and with music and all that. But even in some of the bloodlines, there's got to be something to that. Like a lot of others, it's a lot of fathers and sons who, who I guess not a lot, but a handful of them. No, it, it makes you think like. Adam, that's exactly where I went, right? Why does, you know, why does some kid have a sweet swing, right? Or, or you know, you know, Archie Manning's kids, right? But all, you know, like pass the ball. They, they, they're inheriting something, right? There's something, something going on there too. Um, so. Hey, you have to I'm develop a talent. You have to develop a talent, though. I know you got to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's natural talent, and then right. there's developing the talent as well. Derek was every bit. I was, I was listening to some shit from him from like when he was 13, not too long ago, and I was like, he was blowing my. I remember the first time I saw him at that age and going, "This is the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen in my life." And then he just keeps getting better every time you see him. You know, it's that thing you do have to develop, and that's the thing I respect about him more than probably anything is he just kept growing. Speaking of, all right. Peace, y'all. No, oh, thank you. Good stuff. Anything else you want to add, Garrett, or talk about or mention? Well, I mean, something that popped into my head was, you know, talking about the kids. I know when Devin got together with Dwayne and formed Almond Bets, Devin said, you know, we never started out wanting to play together. It was really, it was him and Dwayne getting together and trying it out and just seeing what would happen. They didn't have an agenda to write an album. And they, it just, he, he said it basically all just happened organically. They got together and they, they played a little bit and then it just, it just kind of all came together. And I, I think that's, that's the best way any of them could have put it is just, you know, we didn't try to force anything. We knew, we knew the fans probably wanted a kind of a next generation. So we just, we got together to just to see where it would go and lucky for, you know, guys like you and me, Adam, it worked out and, they're carrying on the legacy, I guess, is the best way to best way to put it. And they're they're bringing their own. I guess I can say they're bringing their own style to the music, which is which is awesome in its in itself. And I I gotta believe, man, Dick, Dickie ha now has the best seat in the house for you know whenever he wants. If he wants to watch Dwayne, if he wants to, you know, whatever he wants to see, he's got the best seat to watch watch Dwayne progress and. Honestly, I'm kind of jealous. I, I wish I could be at more Dwayne shows and hear more of the, the music come out of that kid. Because, like we've been saying, his dad definitely had a big effect on him and an effect on a lot of people. And talking about, you know, I think it was Bob that mentioned, or maybe it was Alan. I don't remember, but um, about in memory of Elizabeth Reed and how he wrote it. Well, I was uh, thinking about Charlie Starr from Blackberry Smoke when he was playing Dwayne's. Uh, one of Dwayne Allman's guitars, he said, you know, he said, this is not a guitar that you sit down to play something. This guitar tells you what it wants you to play. And maybe that was Dickie when he was writing some of his music. Maybe he had a connection to that guitar. And instead of him trying to do something, that guitar in a way was speaking to Dickie and kind of telling him where to go. And that's how it happened. Maybe, maybe he didn't know how to really describe it. I mean, of course we would never know, but it's just, I guess there, there's there's something to be said about guitar players and how they bond with their instrument. I guess I guess that's with any musician is, you know how they how they bond with what they're what they're playing and what comes out. There's there's something special there for sure. He sounds like he's almost some, like I was. There's so much talent there, but it's almost like somebody who believed in magic and the power of magic and magic through music. And he's and he's talked. It sounds like such like like a character, like a movie character, almost exactly. in in these sort of contradictions. It's like it's like oh, I this I came up with it was easy, but it took a lot of hard work. I don't know where it came from, but you know, I I figured it out in my sleep. Like I, you know, I don't know all these sort of like interesting contradictions and and being a little coy and mysterious. But like, get, like I, I I will conf I will confess. I, I well, I have read uh, One Way Out, the Almond Brothers, uh, Allen's Almond Brothers book. But uh, I do have these two, which I still need to to get to. I got uh, Bob's Play All Night and uh, and Allen's. Uh, most recent one brothers and sisters 
And I am going to try to live, not live tweet, but uh, tweet, thread, stream, whatever. Just like my ongoing reactions and thoughts to these books because I am I am far behind. And I think what I'll do is I'll dig into uh, to Bob to Bob's first because it is chronological, being focused on Dwayne and then and then the uh, brothers and sisters era and, and into the seventies with. Uh, with with Dickie and beyond and in Alan's book, so I'm excited to get into that reading. Reading is fundamental, but I, so it'll right. be fun for me to like react to these books. I did that with uh, with One Way Out. What were you gonna say? I, I was gonna say I've read all of One Way Out too, and that opened my mind up to a lot of you know stuff that went on with the Allman Brothers. And I'm reading Brothers and Sisters right now, and it's I don't have Bob's book yet, but it definitely now is on my list to pick that up and read that after talking to him and listening to some you know, things he's posted online and interviews he's done. He's very interesting. And I, I look forward to listen to uh, reading his book and seeing what his take is. And I, I did listen to uh peeking at the beacon today with uh, Derek and Dickie as the, the guitar players. It's basically everybody uh, in that next generation, kind of the Allman brothers band, except for Warren. And man, that is unique. I mean, it had been a while since I had picked that album up, but, what year is that? I I want to say it's maybe two thousand. Yeah, because I know I noticed online I was kind of looking up the credits and it said that was the last album that Dickie ever a- appeared on before he left the before he left the band. I thought that was kind of interesting. I never I never knew that. I was March two thousand. Right, but yeah, it's definitely very unique. Because when I think of the Almond Brothers, of course, I think of Warren being there, but listening to that today with just Derek and Dickie was cool. It was, it kind of gave, gave me a little bit of a different perspective of what they were before Warren kind of came into the, came into the fold. And it was unique to hear I, uh, Derek and Dickie then to when, uh, D- when Derek and Susan brought him out at the beacon and he sat in with them and what that sounded like. And that was, I, I guess I can say that was as close as I came to seeing Dickie live was watching him on stage with Derek and Susan and, I'll, I'll never forget him reappearing at the beacon. I guess that was the, the last time he'd ever took that stage. I, I think I can't remember. I don't, I don't think he ever, I don't know if he played it on this most recent tour he did before he retired or not, but I could be mistaken, but that was just so unique seeing him up there on that stage again with, with Derek and watching them, what they, what they did together. And just, I don't think anybody really thought they'd see him up on that stage again and then to come out with with a band like ttb and see what magic they could bring that was i mean that that was great for me and i i never got to see dicky live i wish i would have known he was on his last run before he retired or i would have made more of an effort to get there but from all from everything i read and all the videos i watched it seemed like everybody that went was was happy they went of course, dude, I have more, I have so much reading and so much listening and so much watching to dive into, but that's, that's, that's in, again, like somewhat that it will definitely is exciting that I have all this, this material to dive into. That's, 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 that's going to be, be fun for me. Um, what else, what else do we need to, to cover? I, I keep forgetting my, my, <laughs> you go on. If you have if you have anything else you want you wanted to share, I, I'm you know what I'm excited to just get into because what I you know you've seen on my Instagram what I I just throw my cat my phone facing my computer and play YouTube videos of TTV and, yep. and whatever won't get me copyright infringement from live stuff so I'll see if I can play some some Dicky tributes or something like that while I'm cooking my my late dinner even on the West Coast. What time zone are you in again? I'm uh, Eastern Standard Time, so it's I. Uh, let's see, probably close to midnight. To midnight yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I know I normally don't go to bed till about midnight or a little after anyway. So I'm, I'm good. Yeah, maybe if you're throwing stuff on, maybe try to find some of that beacon stuff with him. Yeah, and, I know. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say this. TTB, throw that up. I, I'm gonna have to go watch that again. It's been a while since I've watched not just that, but I'm I want to go back and find some older uh, Dicky, Dicky videos and pull out pull out my albums and play them on my stereo so loud the neighbors can hear it you know <laughs> yeah it's important to to share like if 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 15 people hate us but one person becomes a new fan like that's worth we've it we've done our job 
I think I think so. We'll 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 go with that. But on that note, thank you for your time, Garrett. I I appreciate it. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you as always, Adam. It's always okay. fun to jump on here and uh, talk a little Almond Brothers or Tedeschi trucks or whatever it may be. Yeah, no, so much fun to just be a, a part of the the musical journey on my end. But uh, enjoy the rest of your your rest of your evening late on the East Coast, and we'll talk soon. Yep, sounds good, Adam. Have a good one. You got it. Peace. So there you go. That's episode 151 recap or not recapping. We are, we are remembering and honoring and, and, and offering a tribute in, in some capacity in some small way towards to, uh, to Dickie Betts who passed away to way to that today, earlier today at three 30 in, in the morning, according to, to the chat here, um, a, a sad day and an emotional day and a long day, certainly for so many people who, who loved the man and loved his music and were close to him or not close to him, extended family like so many of us uh, are or feel like or seem to be. Um, and I definitely appreciate uh, Garrett's time and and Bob and and Marley and, and Alan and Andy. And I can't believe I got everyone's name there. I'm, I'm impressed with myself. Uh, for that again, I'm looking forward to to reading uh, Andy's uh, piece coming up. I I'll look out for that. I'll I'll try to remember to send post some links to these things. I'll look for them on on social media and and try to post links to everybody's everybody's stuff and as much uh, dicky content as I can and can in the coming days, weeks, and months. And again, I'll put out an audio version as well of this episode at some point in the next couple of days, this weekend or whatever um what else tedeschi trucks podcast.com at adam Choi instagram and twitter for me um uh, tedeschi trucks band.com is is their their uh their official uh website buy tickets to shows buy merch uh definitely they got check out the tour they got a lot of uh, dates coming up this this summer swamp family uh the fan club the app download that become a part of of that that's a that's a cool community as well that i'm super blessed to be a, a part of um i think that's pretty uh much all i got for today today thank you to ttb to the band to the crew my condolences and sympathies to to dicky betts family friends fan uh, extended family uh and fans of the music like just again i keep i keep coming back to that theme of like uh, no matter who i'm talking to you can hear and feel <laughs> their passion for this music no matter how close you know one might be to the people who created it or not like that passion just shines through and it and connecting with with all y'all out there makes me feel that much a part of part of this world which is fun for me but i think that's about all i got for today i appreciate you guys listening thanks as always maybe we'll we'll pick this up with with more uh dicky bets uh uh centric content coming up and, and tributes and whatnot in the future but hope everyone enjoys the rest of your rest of their rest of your evenings and uh and uh let's talk soon peace <laughs>